High up in the Himalayas, shut off from the world for seven months a year, Diskit could pass off as the fabled Shangri-La. But the reality is down to earth. Tooth decay plagues its people, and the human eye suffers from the sun's glare. But a team of doctors are on their way. When the road up the mountains thaws in summer, they'll embark on their house call to Diskit. To get 15 doctors, dentists, and a nurse up the Himalayas, you need a mountain of supplies and someone to make tough decisions. It's mostly the medical stuff. I want to reorganize that so that we get some of the drugs into one. Dr. Myra Elliott, commander of the mission and a veteran in medical missions. We only will do what we think we can manage. You mustn't do what you can't manage. Say somebody comes with a big hernia, I would say, no, no, we're not going to do that. If there's a lump in bump, we can, whatever we can manage, we, whatever we do must not leave with more problems. We must solve that problem whilst we are there. So that's what we do. Huh? Oh, hi, Paul. Paul, a self-confessed city boy, is heading for his first medical mission his first taste of dentistry outside a properly equipped dental clinic. I've always wanted to go on a trip, um, but, you know, that's, that's the idea in my mind. That's, that's sort of, a, I guess, a romanticized view of charity work, right? Yeah, this is just basically about finding out a bit more about me and whether I'm cut up for this. Most people are fairly tough. Now, we've done now 20, 30 journeys. Most trips never had any problem. Occasionally, one or two are, are difficult to see, and they want they fuss, they fuss on, they want a five-star hotel, and they're sorry, you're not going to get a five-star hotel. So just to make sure the plots work. Every needle, every scrap of bandage the team will need for their clinic will be carted up. There are no 7-Elevens in Diskit. If something fails up there, the mission is dead in the water. Diskit may be just over 4,000 kilometers from Singapore on the map, but it's two days, four time zones, and three airports away. Perched 4,000 meters up in the Himalayas, it's one of the poorest places in India. In a cloudless world of harsh summer sunshine and blinding glare from winter snow, the UV light is so intense here, even the young are inflicted with eye problems. Generations before, the people of Diskit lived off the land. Then the Indian army arrived, bringing with it refined sugar and modern diets. But dental care is hard to come by, even if the people could afford it. After more than 10 hours of roughing it out in airport lounges, the team finally arrives at Leh, the closest airstrip to Diskit. There's another five hours by road ahead of them, but Bill Kite has it all figured out. Bill runs a trekking business here, and it was his idea to get Myra and her team up here. His way of giving back to a community he has chosen to live among for nearly 30 years. Giants. The three giants of humanitarian efforts. My hero of Ladakh, my hero of Singapore. All right. Before the doctors can travel the final stretch to Diskit, Bill insists they rest and acclimatize. The team is now 4,000 meters above sea level. The air is thinner, and the doctors soon feel its effects. No elevators. That's the staircase. That's the one gripe I have about this place. No elevators. Huh? Well, we started about 14 hours ago in, uh, in Singapore. Yeah, it was quite 
quite a lot of time spending economy class seats and, and airport lounges, sleeping on the floor. But uh, you know, getting here, it's been you know well worth it. It's been a good little pick me up to the spirits. Today, the doctors have been told to rest and relax, but the long journey and the thin air soon claims the first victim of altitude sickness. Okay. Well, I think with a bit of oxygen and the Dexter has been given to you, I think she'll be not okay. Yeah? Okay. Should be okay. <laughs> should be all right. Yeah. Otherwise, we have to send you back. No. Thankfully, he's among fellow doctors. The next morning, the last leg begins. Morning, fellas. This morning, we're going across um, to Diskit. So we're going over to the Nubra Valley um, over a very, very high pass. We're a little bit careful about this because it is very, very high. Don't, don't film me if I chuck. <laughs> the only road to Diskit is by the notorious Kardong La, the highest motorable road in the world. With steep falls and constant avalanches, a drive through here has been called by the National Geographic as one of the world's most perilous journeys. Traffic is supposed to travel only in one direction at different times of the day. That, at least, is the theory. Diskit lies at the end of the five-hour drive. Geographically a part of India, its spirit lies closer to Tibet. This is where the doctors will spend their next four days, and their clinic will be set up at the local school, where traditional welcome awaits them. <laughs> but Myra's mind is focused on getting her clinic set up and open for business. That afternoon, the doctors break in their new clinic with some simpler cases. <laughs> Though you wouldn't have guessed it from the screams of kids on their very first visit to the dentist. And even on the first day, Myra has lined up a few operations to remove benign growths. Some of Myra's patients need persuading. A scalpel in the eye is terrifying at any age. So Papa can sit with her and tell her it's really no pain. Very good. She's very good, isn't she? She's best. Very, very good. By late afternoon, the case is thin out, and Myra even finds time for a little pop quiz. How many times should you brush your teeth in one day? How many times? Yes. Not yes. But this is just the lull before the storm that will break out tomorrow. In Diskit, up in the Himalayas, a team of doctors have set up a makeshift clinic. Marcus Ong an ophthalmologist has given up his vacation leave to join the group. So he's glad, at least for the postcard scenery. <laughs> By 9 a.m., the first patients arrive. It's a slow start, and Marcus has no hint of the chaos that is about to descend on the free clinic. I'm so old. I'm so frail. In another part of Diskit, 45-year-old Tashi is getting ready to head down to the clinic to meet the doctors. Tashi lives with her husband, their farmers, and their three daughters have left home to study. So she has to help in the farm, and despite a nagging pain in her eyes, she manages to keep the family home spick and span all by herself. So the man's in when, when she feel uh, pain in her eye, 
she have uh, she has to do all this work sometimes she work uh, keeping her fingers and hand here and <laughs> walking only walking yeah tashi also suffers from a bad toothache the nearest dentist is hours away and too expensive then she heard about the foreign doctors making a house call on diskit back at the school and makeshift clinic news of the doctor's visit has spread. <laughs> Hundreds of people have turned up in just a few hours. The school's headmaster has to be roped in for crowd control. Inside, things aren't going smoothly either. One of the team's compressors is not working. Without it, the team will lose one of their three dental units. <laughs> Myra Elliott procured a state-of-the-art Italian compressor, really a brilliant piece of equipment in Singapore. Um, but by the time it made it up here to Ladakh, some small malfunction of some kind, and it would not retain the pressure necessary to run this unit. Meanwhile, outside the clinic, the crowd is growing and growing impatient. This is no time for a dental malfunction. I thought we tested this equipment in your office. Exactly. And then it's not working, that's why I'm so disappointed, you see? Even our cameraman gets roped in with the repair. But it was the doctor who finally figured it out. We were resigned to probably not being able to utilize this thing because of a simple malfunction of a brand new compressor. But Meyer <laughs> took amalgam, the same material that you use to fill a tooth, and patched the hole in the compressor <laughs> with the amalgam, and now it's working perfectly. So we're going to be able to use the ADEC unit after all because Myra filled the cavity in the compressor. <laughs> With the compressor finally working, the dentists get down to work. Though Paul is having a little problem settling in. Oh, it's a massive pain. I mean, the uh, doing things standing up, patients sitting on little chairs, and you've, uh, you basically, uh, uh, when you do extractions, you've got to basically do it squatting or kneeling down, you know? There's no nurse or suction to speak of, so there's. There's saliva and blood and guts, well not guts, but blood everywhere, and you, that, that really impedes your field of vision. But you, know, you just gotta roll with it. With the endless stream of patients coming his way, Paul didn't have much choice but to deal with the culture shock. Back outside, the registration table is overwhelmed. <laughs> Tashi arrives in the midst of the chaos and slips in at the back of the queue. Her first appointment is over at the eye clinic, where a line has formed and she's in for another stretch of waiting. Inside the eye clinic, after what he thought was a slow start, Marcus is overwhelmed. To cope with the crowds, he has roped in local volunteers to do the initial testing to separate the mild and severe cases. What can she read? He's one of the He's one of the Yeah, this. So she can't go all the way. For many of the patients here, their poor eyesight needs little more than a simple pair of prescription glasses. But Tashi's case turns out to be more complicated. She complains of pain in her eyes, and she hopes the doctor will make it go away. So ask her, is there any pain in the eyes? And here's one of them. Yeah. Which one? Which one? Which one? Which one? Which one? Both eyes, but she's feeling much, much pain in this eye. Yeah. Okay, she needs... She tell her she has cataracts in both eyes. Both eyes. Okay, but she needs surgery. Just now we tried plus. Give her plus, plus. The diagnosis is not good. The clinic is not set up for cataract surgery. Tashi needs to head down to Leh or Delhi for a cataract operation. And until she can afford it, Marcus can only offer some short-term relief. Basically, she has a myopia as well. She needs a degree. But for now, the glasses will help her read and do sewing and help her do look at things in the dark. Okay? But she still needs the surgery in the long term. 
if we were in a developed country like Singapore, cataract is a small problem. But here, it's it's a big headache for them. He, he needs uh, he has cataract he has cataracts in both eyes. Marcus soon discovers Tashi's case is a lot more common than he thought. Because we're at altitude and the UV rays are four times, five times more stronger, so they get. Things like skin growths, which is pterygium. I've seen uh, a lot of the cataracts in younger patients. And because of the dry conditions, they get a lot of uh, mewobane gland disease. That's why he's always teaching them how to wash the eyes. So all these are the very, very common. All of them have it. It's like default. Many cataract patients will have to live with their condition. Many will never be able to afford surgery in Leh or Delhi. But Bill is trying to change this by raising funds for the operations. We see hundreds of people here who are intelligent, capable, but disconnected from the opportunity. They don't get to go to school. They don't get to go to the hospital. They don't get to grow up to be strong and healthy because when they were three, they didn't have one dollar's worth of medicine. And, and now they're limping or they're, they have compromised vision. It's the tyranny of the, the have and the have nots. Meanwhile, more patients are coming in, and they're stretching the clinic's limited facilities. Don't move, don't move. In Diskit, India, a team of Singapore doctors are running a free clinic, but the eye clinic is closed for emergency surgery. A patient cannot shut his eyes, and he's been referred to Marcus. He has uh, exposure of his eyes for the past five years, and already under the slit lamp, you can see some ulceration in the lower part. So essentially, on this side. So essentially, when he closes his eyes, he's still totally exposed. So this is eyes closed. Dust, dirt, even insects have invaded his eyes. He's had to live with this for five years now. Marcus thinks he can help him out. We can do a simple procedure, which is a lateral tarsography. So essentially, what we do is that we suture both lids, the upper lid and lower lid together, only at the side, at the periphery. So the downside, obviously, is that one eye will appear smaller than the other, okay? But the upside is that he won't get ulceration and get blinded. We tell him there's a little bit of pain, don't move. Okay, yeah. Uh, As with any eye operation, precision is necessary to prevent further damage to the eyes. Oh, 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 oh. Don't move, don't move. So this is a temporary thing. We need to give him eye drops as well, antibiotics to treat the ulcer. And then later on, he can go to lay and get a proper, either a proper tarsography done, or he can even go for other procedures, some complicated surgery. Yeah? In the meantime, Myra is taking on another difficult case. A man has come in with a growth behind his ears. She's excised the, the cyst, and it, it was under so much pressure that when she started her work, it virtually erupted. And now I have a small little scar, and it's over. It's fantastic. OK, he needs to go to a clinic to take out the stitches after one week. It's OK. It's good. It's good. It's, good. it's, good. it's, good. it's, good. it's all right. Finish. Okay. Mr. Tashi, yeah? Tashi's wait for her turn with the dentist has finally ended. She has an ache in her gums and she can hardly taste her food. Okay. So tell her we're doing filling here. What? Filling. Yeah. Okay, we close up the hole here. So we only extract two teeth. Yeah. Upper left, last yeah. tooth. Yeah. Lower left, yeah. last tooth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just tell her. Yeah, yeah. And we do yeah. filling. Yeah, yeah. Our filling is lower. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're leaving that. Don't worry. We won't touch that. Tashi's condition is common in Diskit. At least it has been for a generation now. But the reality of this environment is minus 20, minus 30. So you can imagine the trauma of drinking cold water, eating cold foods with massive tooth decay. Now we wait for the anesthesia to take effect, okay? 
so there's an underlying silent scream in this in this population of of a of a widespread agony that is so commonplace that people think it's normal now. It's numbs now. generation of young people think that tooth decay and mouth pain and eating and sleeping in pain is normal because all of their friends say, yes, I'm going through the same thing. Tashi's treatment is complete, and like everyone here, will be leaving with some preventive advice and her name on a list of cataract operations. Yeah. 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 She's saying that every, everybody of this remote area must take the benefits of this scan, tell their problem to doctors, uh, what disease they have. Yeah, like this. <laughs> after four days, after more than a thousand patients, it's finally time to say goodbye. Through the rough journeys, the backbreaking work, and the vegetarian meals, they have persevered and improved the lives of the people here. I guess it's an eye opener. And uh, it's been challenging, you know, I had the food was a bit dodgy, I had gastro a couple of days, and um, I had cold showers most of the time we've been here. <laughs> The short answer is yes, I consider going again, but I, I don't know I don't know when and I don't know where. I don't know where I go next year, but it's it's probably been enjoyable enough. It's probably been positive enough on the whole for me to say yeah, I'd probably I'd probably go again.